Hello everyone. Good evening. Good evening. How are you all? Doing good? Awesome. My name is Ivan Salinas. I'm the programs coordinator here at Beyond Baroque. I'd like to give you a warm welcome. We're a nonprofit literary arts organization founded in 1968 by George Jerry Smith. A project that began as an experimental literary magazine and evolved into the interdisciplinary art space we know today. Since the late 70s, the organization has taken residency here in the original uh, Venice City Hall building. We're a place dedicated to the possibilities of language, providing a platform for readings, writing workshops, and gallery exhibitions year round. I'd like to acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples. Venice is home to the Wonka, Sangha, Tongva villages. We acknowledge the wrong done to indigenous peoples through colonialism and genocidal practices. As an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting their communities, stories, and cultures. I want to plug in just a little bit of the work we do here at Beyond Baroque. We have a few exciting things happening in the space this month. It is Pride Month, and we'll be celebrating with a Career Writers Festival curated by the Los Angeles Poet Society, and that's happening this Saturday. Poets will be sharing the stage, uh, they will have a DJ, uh, there'll be a drag show, uh, some art and food vendors in our courtyard. So it'll be a big party and you all are invited to it. Um, on Sunday, we'll be paying tribute to poet Bert Myers, prominent LA poet of the modern era and influential, influential to many contemporary writers. Uh, this will be led by poets Dana Levin, Amy Gersler, and Bert's son, Daniel Myers, among a few others. And Tuesday will be an unusual one because we usually host programming on Fridays, Saturdays, on the weekends, but Tuesday we made an exception to host uh, F. Douglas Brown, Natalie Graham, and a few other poets. So uh, you can check out all this and more information on our website, as well as the intensive workshops we're offering. Uh, there's at least about one every every month. Uh, sometimes there's up to three, but these are uh, facilitated by prominent writers, both prose and poetry. Um, they come to the space and, and host the workshop. But every week you can find a free online workshop in fiction every Monday night and every Wednesday night uh, in poetry. And uh, we'll have a short break in July, but we'll be back and we'll pre be presenting a, a new series of, uh, of readings. We are planning one to have uh, poets take over the, this famous staircase over here that is in our beautiful lobby. And they'll be reading some poetry there. Um, we'll be showing some poetry films here in the theater. And um, a very exciting collaboration with the Thomas Mann House and um, Misna uh, and the Radius of Arab American Writers. We are hosting a conversation and reading with poet Gayath Almedun and Egyptian American writer Rhonda Gerard. Uh, both will be in conversation as they write about exile and how political conflicts in the Middle, in the middle East impact their writings and their identity. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, and this couldn't be possible without the support of, uh, of our audience and our members. So please consider becoming a Beyond Broke member. You're supporting the space and helping our mission and providing free programming and supporting authors at an international level. If you like what you hear tonight as well, uh, just know that we have books of our authors uh, this evening. Um, I do regret to say, without the, with the exception of uh, Stacy Levin, who uh, unfortunately we couldn't get their books on time. I really apologize, but just know that they are available online. If you go to bookshop.org and you'd like to support our bookstore there, uh, Beyond Baroque, we actually get a, a cut of those purchases. So that's that's an area also in popular other popular websites, Amazon, um, and your favorite indie bookstore, why not? So um, yes, please support our authors, support the space. Um, huge shout out to the Beyond Baroque, Baroque team, uh, Eric Alberg, Tech Master, uh, staff Genesis Perez in the bookstore, our directors, Quinn Ring and Jamie Vega. And thank you all for choosing to be here tonight. Um, 
I thought this was a very special evening. Uh, I've only been working here at Beyond Broke for about two years, but one of the names you hear um, you hear around in the space is Green Integer and Sun and Moon. And I was like, welcome to this um, new world of, um, well, not necessarily new, but just the world of writers that um, I didn't know of and that you know, have had so so much history in LA and here um, in this space specifically. So it's it's a huge honor to be in the presence of so many good writers. And um, because of that, I um, want to welcome a huge, important piece to, to this puzzle, um, the disseminator responsible for getting the work out of, of our writers tonight and who will be hosting from um, the, the evening. So uh, current publisher of Green Energy and original founder of Sun and Moon Press, please welcome to the stage Douglas Messerly. Gee, it's nice to be new again, <laughs> seen as new again. I hadn't been to Beyond Rope for quite a while, um, at least probably since COVID. And I'm really delighted by the rejuvenation, the excitement that's going on uh, at this center again. So I hope everyone will keep coming back and bring others too, because this has become a really exciting center again. And it's had it's had its great days and its not so great days, but it's it's I think it's back to the really great days and good to see that. Tonight, I'm really, delighted, not only because four of my dearest friends are reading, but also because these are some of my favorite writers who I have published, but they've also been published by many other presses. It's not just Green Integer and Sun and Moon Press, but I think I did maybe most of their first books. So somewhere along the line, I, I, I chanced upon these wonderful, wonderful writers and was able to, to, get, to get them into the, into the series, so to speak, of, of publishing. Um, I'm going to just announce them. I'm going to talk about them all together so you don't have to, I don't have to keep getting up and going down. And they'll just follow one another. And I'm going to announce, I'm going to talk about them in the order in which they're probably going to read. Let me just add that these writers are a bit different from your tip. Most of them write all of them write fiction, and some. And I'm going to argue all of them write poetry as well. And that's one of the differences between this group and other many other fiction writers. They use language in a way that is also poetic and expressive, and they're very concerned with it and. They work with it and, and they suffer with it, which is part of what makes their work so absolutely wonderful to hear and also just so fascinating to read. It's not just prose writing, it's prose and poetry and drama and all sorts of other forms along with it. And that's one of the things that make these four almost belong together and, and to have them in one room reading it's just an absolute delight. I'm, I'm so pleased for that. First one who's going to read is Rebecca Goodman, who just has a wonderful, wonderful new book out called Forgotten Night, which is already getting a lot of attention. And there's an interview with her in the new Rain Taxi, which is a review that comes out of uh, Minneapolis. And it, it's a very, very nice interview, Rebecca. You're very lucky. And um, she's previously published on Green Integer, The Surface of Motion, and then she did a wonderful, wonderful memory, thoughtful piece about her mother and about that life of, of, of that time, uh, After Sight, which is a wonderful book. And she teaches creative writing at Chapman University. Martin Nacal also is at Chapman University and has been very active and written so many books that it's almost hard to begin to name them. His most recent, recent book of poetry is Consciousness by Supton Daivu Press, who's published a lot of his fiction 
more recently and his some of his poetry and we published uh, two fields that face and mirror each other uh, some years back plus a very early book of his too and uh, he's a remarkable uh, fiction writer and very very active in encouraging students to become writers as well i spent with rebecca and martin a wonderful absolutely glorious um, two months in Ischia, two weeks, excuse me, I wish it were two months, <laughs> two weeks in Ischia a few years ago, and that was a memorable experience. They were teaching in Ischia of all places. It's kind of wonderful. Wendy Walker is the author of The Sea Rabbit, the, or The Artist of Life, The Secret Service, Stories Out of Omari, The Camperdown Elm, and I think she'll be reading tonight from her newest publication, Sexual Stealing, and she'll tell you about some of the process that she uses there. Um, Wendy also uses Ulipoian kind of techniques. I wouldn't call them strictly that, but they, they, they relate to that in some kind of way. The Ulipo group created formal structures which they imposed upon themselves in writing their works, not all of which are very obvious or evident. They're not simple, they're complex sometimes. And that creates a kind of new, a new difficulty in the work that, that enriches it and makes it even more um, splendiferous to go through and experience. And Stacey Levine um, from Seattle, but originally St. Louis, um, has written a wonderful book, um, My Horse and Other Stories, which, won, which we published on Sun and Moon Press, but also won the Penn, uh, the, one of the earliest uh, Penn West Awards, and it was wonderfully received. And since then, she's also written Draw, which we published, and France, Francis Johnson, one of my very favorites, and The Girl with Brown Hair, she has a new novel coming out that she's been, in fact, working, working very strongly on getting the galleys sort of in, in, in final shape. And she'll be reading, I, I presume from that tonight, Mice, uh, which, Mice 1961, rather. And that will be um, really wonderful to hear also. So we'll begin with Rebecca reading. Thank you, Douglas. I'm going to be reading from uh, the beginning of Forgotten Night. Three times I knocked on the door at 12 Rue, Rue de Juif. I waited, the courtyard still. From steep wooden stairs leading to the ramparts, a cat hissed at me. I knocked again. The stone walls were cracked, musty, a sign on the stairs warned of danger. The cat came down a step out of its steep darkness. I held my hand out to it. It hissed again. No motion, no wind. The sky above the courtyard, gray, almost hidden. I stepped back, the presence of memory shifting inside me. I stepped back, unable to speak. A woman pushing a baby stroller walked past. Madame, she stopped. Can I help you? She didn't move. She repeated, can I help you? She looked down, lifting the corner of the blue blanket covering the baby carriage. I could not see the baby. I did not hear a sound, not a cry, not a breath. She waited and willing to leave. At once a strange distance between us, what I wanted to reveal to her but could not, the notion of self, the representation of the body, blurred moments that erase the space we stood in. I looked up at the shuttered windows, the empty flower pots. I thought I heard voices, laughter, quickly dissolving into silence. Was there no one left? I'm looking for Madame Brissac, I said. I think she lives here. The woman shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, she answered. The name, she asked. Brissac, I repeated. I believe the family lives here. 
I don't know, she answered. She smiled, pointed to the center of town. Ask in town. Good day, she said. She opened the door on the far side of the gravel courtyard, entered, then shut the door behind her. I knocked again. No sound, no response. When I stepped back from the door, I looked up. Words rained all around me. At first, a soft drizzle, conjunctions, words that seemed to connect but not describe, and but so. And I thought about those words that tried to connect, my childhood, my line notebook, my awkward print, and then softly the words penetrating my clothes, my body, adverbs, adjectives, raining down on my skin, beneath my skin, flowing through me, disguising me, revealing me, forming the notion of who I was and who I could be. When I looked around, I was ensconced in language, a language I could not understand but feel, words breaking apart mid-air, fractured into letters, consonants, vowels, symbols, punctuation marks, broken into images, sounds, bird calls, wind, the water well, the stream, the walls surrounding the village, the silence around me, the landscape of my body, of my history, of the courtyard, foreign and yet near. Every word that fell on me marked me with a closeness I could almost reach, an impenetrable distance that betrayed me, the distance between. Time fractured, I looked down, the words dissolved into puddle, puddles, alone in the courtyard, the distant sounds in the square beyond. I stepped back, waiting, watching for movement, with the shutters open, the blue paint peeling, the steep dark stairs leading to the ramparts, the sudden constraint of time. A black cat emerged from the shed in the courtyard, it peered at me from the darkness. The next time I knocked on the door at 12 Rue des Juifs, I heard footsteps. The door opened. It was a small boy, perhaps six years old. He looked at me without saying a word. He rubbed his eyes, staring straight ahead past me. I asked, is your mother or father at home? He didn't respond. A few moments later, I heard a baby crying in the background, some shuffling from within the dark corridor. It was a warm afternoon. The lights were off. Perhaps the family had been asleep. Finally, a woman came to the door. She wore a pale blue sundress. She carried a baby in her arms. She said, may I help you? I said, I'm very sorry. I hope I didn't disturb you. No, she said, can I help you? The baby continued to cry. She hugged it closer to her body. I said, I'm looking for a Madame Brissac. I believe she lives here or has lived here. Madame Brissac? No, she said. My family has lived here for generations. I'm sorry to have disturbed you, I said. I must have the wrong address. She said, Brissac? The name, she asked. Not familiar. Juif, she asked. Yes, I said. I believe so. Not possible, she said. Someone in the village might know, I said. No, she said. I doubt it. Jews haven't lived in this village for over 500 years. I stepped back. She said, not here. I leaned against the water well in the courtyard. Moss grew around and along the stone structure. I sat down on the broken wooden bench next to the well. Birds everywhere, everywhere their sound. The day increasingly humid. Footsteps in the distance. The bus arrived outside the upper gates, just beyond the old ghetto. I got on, the doors closing behind me. The bus descended, winding around the fortress walls of the village. It was early spring, the green hillsides covered in grapevines. The heat was stifling. I sat in the middle of the bus, filled with young students and elderly women. No one spoke. In the valley, the bus stopped again at an isolated stop. No village, just a bench on the side of the road. A man got on. He sat in the seat across the aisle from me. He said, can I open the window for you? I'm fine, I said. Thank you. He smiled. Laughter came from the back of the bus. I turned around. Two young boys rustled each other in their seats. My back was wet. I wiped my upper lip. He continued to watch me. He said, you're visiting? Yes, I answered. For long? Not sure, I answered. He smiled again, taking off his dark blue jacket. He folded it across his lap. He turned his body to face mine. The bus driver shouted at the children. Hey, he yelled. 
You kids in the back. I turned around. The two boys giggled. The man said, I'm interested in your face. I'm an artist. I shook my head, not knowing what to say. I'd like to photograph you, he said. I'm not sure, I answered. He said, of course. I understand. I pulled the fabric of the dress away from my body. We're coming to my stop, he said. He pulled out a, a pen and small notebook from the pocket of his jacket. He said, I'm setting up an exhibit in, the, in this village. I'll write down the address. I think you'll enjoy it. He tore out the page from his notebook, reaching across the aisle to hand the note to me. I took it from him. He held out his hand. Luca Corbeau, he said, please come by. The bus stopped at the next village. He got off, turning back to look at me. He smiled before he turned to enter through the village gates. The bus passed two more villages before crossing a bridge over a narrow river and stopping at an industrial outpost. About to exit, I asked the driver for directions to the old cemetery. He shrugged. I wouldn't know, he said. It was now late afternoon. I walked through two roundabouts. On either side, white block buildings, deserted parking lots, forgotten, abandoned. At the second roundabout, there was a small white sign pointing east towards the Jewish cemetery. I followed the sign. Occasionally, a car passed, honking at me as I walked along the empty streets. At each crossroad, I at each crossroad, I stopped. No place to hide. Where could I go? The sun beat down, the heat unbearable. Inside my shoes, my feet swelled. At the next roundabout, the road ended. The ground grew marshy, wet. To the right, a white path leading up into the hills. To the left, the road, with no sign, appeared to lead back to the village. I crossed a small bridge over the marshy landscape. Weeds and wildflowers grew tall. Cicadas, birds, no sign of human life. I passed a farm, no workers, no animals. I followed a narrow dirt path toward and around a high cement wall. Across the way, a small two-story brick structure, perhaps a house, surrounded by a wire fence. Still no movement. Inside the fence, a tractor, barrels, weeds. As I passed, two Rottweilers inside the fence ran at me, barking sniffing, digging at the dirt at the bottom of the fence. I couldn't breathe. I passed the house, walking on. The cemetery gates were closed, but not locked. I pushed them open and went inside, the ground covered in white gravel, the light reflecting off the whiteness inside a landscape of dark tombstones, some so blackened it was impossible to read the names. The cemetery extended in two directions, a small chapel in the back. I returned to the left side of the cemetery, holding my purse close to my body. The writing on the tombstones worn away, barely decipherable, only dates, no names. 1896, 1897, 1889, 1888. Silence broke. A truck drove up the dirt path, stopping at the two-story structure outside the cemetery gates. The dogs barked. A train passed in the woods behind the cemetery. I stood just inside the cemetery gates waiting, waiting to see what the driver would do. He pulled into the yard next to the house. Two men got out of the truck and began unloading boxes. The dogs ran up to the men. The men didn't notice me. I waited until they left before I moved. At the entrance to the graveyard stood a large monument to the victims of the Holocaust, I don't know why I proceeded. With each step, the gravel beneath my feet cracked, as if at any moment the silence of the landscape would eviscerate me, the stone stella crumbling. Who had gone before? Who had surrendered? The names on the stones, now barely discernible, only dates. I passed among the unknown with only a marker to show that they had once been here. Where were their families now? Where had they gone? No sign of flowers, of movement, of visitors, to remember them. As I walked, I imagined I was walking with my father. Where was my mother's stone? So far away now, across an ocean, across a continent, not here, but where? Absent of the verdant wasteland between us. My father and I wandered the cemetery, looking for the names of our family, of my family's family. He said, I used to know where your grand grandmother was buried. He said, I don't know where my father is. I said, it's here, but where? He said, I need to clean the stones for them. I'm now the gatekeeper.
A mockingbird landed on top of a tombstone, squawking three times before flying off. The door to the chapel was locked. I turned around, searching for dates, searching for names, the rows of dead. I read the names that were visible, Khan, Dreyfus, Vile, Marceau, Ackerman, Marx, Levy, Lieberman, Loeb, Ratisbeau, C. Strauss, Kahan, Levy, Levy, Vion, Weiler, Weiler, VG. At what point did names become things pointing to his, pointing to a history I could I no longer understood? Fisher, Gutman, Klatsky, Braun, the landscape of the inevitable. At the juncture between the third and fourth row, I saw it, the name Brisek, carved into the stone. I touched it, afraid to feel what I feared most, the name on the tombstone, Abraham Brisek, born 1849, died 1906. Was it the same, same Brisek, same family? Above his name, the carved image of a book. At first I kneeled, then sat down on the white gravel. The earth was hot, the stones painful. I pulled my notebook out of my purse, pulling a piece of paper from it. I wrote the words, I will find you. I folded the paper and buried it among the warm stones in front of the grave. At the entrance gates, there was a faucet and a basin below it. I turned the spigot. It did not work. I walked out to the highway. The bus that was supposed to arrive that afternoon didn't come. Though it was still light out, I could see that darkness would arrive soon. I sat down on the bench. I looked up, imagining I could see, stranded here, in a place unfamiliar, resonant with lies, half-truths, sounds that echoed in an open space, surfaced in the closed and claustrophobic world that refused to change. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to read from this book, Consciousness, published in 21 by Spiden, <clears throat> with images by the publisher himself. Some lies about the birds of Venice. One, Alice Monet. In Venice, Madame Alice Monet wrote in her diary that the birds she heard on awakening each dawn, not the legendary flocks of pigeons, of course, but the plethora of other birds, passerine, were like no other bird song she'd ever heard. Quote, I'm sure she wrote that it's the influence not only led by the bells of the Campanile di San Marco, from all the bells of the bell towers gathering together. It's not coincidental that after centuries and generations, birds flying amid the bells, those birds absorb the sounds into their bodies into their minds, to the point where they magnificently have altered their own song. The birds, to some degree, are the bells. Bells, the birds. When I can't sleep, I imagine the bird song I will hear again at dawn, until I do sleep, having become, to some degree myself, the birds, the bells. to Michel Sambique. An extensive, exhaustive study of birds worldwide 
<clears throat> reveals there may be as many as 500,000 species. <clears throat> In the early part of the 20th century, the aviarian Michel Sambach embarked on an investigation to discover what effect the sounds of different birds chirping had on different populations of people. Did certain birds have a calming effect while other birds an excitatory effect? Did certain birds make people think differently than did other birds? Monsieur Sambach began working in South America, intending to travel on every continent. After 16 months' work, he gave it up. He wrote in his diary, quote, It's not possible to arrive at any conclusions. There are far too many factors, variables. For example, how can you isolate in Brazil, the effect of the song of the incredible Momotas Momota from the effect of the forest itself. How in Kenya, separate the effect of the song of the red-winged lark from the effects of the grassland. How distinguish the influence of hunger from the influence of bird song. Monsieur Sambach's friend, Georges Clemenceau, a friend also of the Monets, wrote to Sambach about Madame Monet's impressions of the birds of Venice. Monsieur Sambach quickly departed to Italy. In Venice, he took a room in the same hotel where the Monets stayed, Barbaro Palace on the Grand Canal. On waking his first morning in Venice, he wrote in his notebook, Madame Monet was right. Looking back on it, every bird I've listened to over the last 16 months has a similar effect. If only you can listen and learn to hear. When Monsieur Sambac ran out of money, an Italian friend, Michelangelo Venetiano, gave Sambach a room in his Venice home. Unfortunately, that room was on the ground floor when the canals flooded that year in their annual cycle. Not only were some important papers of Sambach's nearly destroyed, but Venetiano, in disgust, gave up this annual Venetian ordeal and left the city. Sambach had no choice but to go home. Three, Robert Strahd. My friend Robert Strahd told me that his only, the only regret in his life was that after reading in Madame Alice Monet's letters about the birds of Venice, he wanted desperately to go there, to wake up in the morning to hear the birds that Madame Monet heard. But of course, he couldn't. He told me that if he heard those birds, his life would be complete. Everything he'd suffered would be made tolerable. Well, first of all, I think he vastly over overstated the case. No bird song, no matter how soft or how elegant, can do that for you. But more importantly, I asked him, Robert, that's your only regret? You don't regret murdering the bartender? No. Don't you regret murdering the prison guard at Leavenworth in front of 1,100 prisoners? Don't you regret the brutality against others that got you years and years and years of solitary confinement, even if that confinement meant discovering the canaries? Don't you regret a life of violence and imprisonment how can you so dishonor the victims of your violence by giving me this crap about hearing the birds of Venice being your only great regret? You know what he told me? He told me, I didn't really murder anyone. Then he said, did I? I didn't really murder anybody, did I? 
And I'll tell you what I think, Harold. I think that Stroud dreamt somehow. He'd heard those birds of Venice. And that bird song, mad as this all is, erased the sins of his life for him. You know, I found him so congenial, so sweet, but I didn't meet him until after the canary. Yet this delusion about the birds of Venice. But I'll tell you something. You go to Venice. You tell me what it's like. Because when I get out of here, and that'll be quite soon now, as you know, I'm going to Venice. You'll lend me the money. I'll pay it back. If I can begin my life of freedom after lo these many years of imprisonment with hearing those birds, then I'll make it the rest of the way. I'll be all right. Listen to me. P.S. Have you ever seen the Monets from his Venice sojourn? They're amazing. They'll make you smile and weep and evoke quiet peace in you all at once. They have that kind of evocative possibility. Letter from Johannes Fold from Alcatraz to Harold Levitsky. Four. <clears throat> Harold Levitsky. The world, the world is in fact a sleepy place. Everyone at any given moment could just let go and their bodies fall and find themselves wherever they are, lying down, asleep. It's a sweet thought, a sweetening image of being. There is a tribe in South America that acts the reality of this. They sleep, they hunt, they cook, they eat, they have sex, they celebrate their rituals, and in their hammocks, chewing on some mildly psychedelic plant root, they sleep. They sleep away mornings and afternoons. They sleep away evenings. And then, after ceremonies that exhaust them, they go into bed. They sleep in peace, untroubled by anything but the most luminous of dreams. Even in dreams of violence, they are the victors, dreams of hunting, dreams of wars with neighboring tribes, dreams of violent ritual. So their dreams are never rattled by anything disturbing enough to interrupt their sleep. It's almost, not quite, but almost as if, when they die, someone would put them in the hammock where they spent their life and they would belong unto eternity. I write about these people from my hotel room now at the Barbaro Palace in Venice because as I'm about to go to university to lecture on this tribe in Brazil, whom I studied, lived with, got to know intimately, the birds chirp outside my window. Do they remind me of the birds of Brazil? No, I don't think so. But their soft chirp has a soporific effect on me. I could just fall into my bed and sleep so happily. But no. I'm a civilized man, a scholar. I belong to a whole different culture from my people in Brazil. I have business to perform that has little to do with hunting or eating or sex. I have to go, to, I have to go lecture people who most likely will wish they could live like my Brazilian friend. They could go to their hammocks as I speak in the great hall. Or on the other hand, they will condemn me, condemn my Brazilian tribe for their laziness, their slowness, their waste of their lives. Either way, I'll go shower, I'll dress. The sound of those birds here will drift only into the background of my day until perhaps if I wake up early enough tomorrow, I'll hear them. I have no obligations in the morning. Maybe I'll sleep in, but maybe not. Either way, I will not include in my lecture the experience of hearing certain members of the tribe in their sleep flawlessly replicate the bird songs of the rainforest.
for my protection and to shield the tribe. Five, planche au chede Monet. Madame Alice Monet wrote to her daughter that in Venice the soft chirping of the birds at dawn was a powerful thing, a delicate power that entered into her sleep and that became a long moment's extreme, soft, deep, fleeting, but lasting pleasure when she awoke. Even, she wrote, when Monet despaired, finding his canvases ugly, finding that Venice was too beautiful to be painted, that it was untranslatable. Madame Monet, still, each dawn, was always heartened by the birds, by the birds' soft chirping. The birds' soft chirping would mingle with, those ang with her anxiety, not dispersing them, not even diluting them, but as if molecule by molecule, displace them with their sonorous and radiant reality. If, she told Monet, I could translate those sounds into white lead, cadmium yellow, vermilion, matter, cobalt blue, chrome green, wouldn't that be as magnificent an oratorio as a Monet canvas, a magnificent vision? But mostly, she wrote, she was so happy to see Monet once he found a way to come into it, so impassioned by his Venetian canvases, his Venetian canvases, as he moved around daily, following light. At least, she wrote, for the time being anyway, no more of those lilies. I love those Venetian paintings, she later wrote, from Givenchy, where Monet finished them, as the highest expression of his art. They are not Venice, she wrote. They are not the birds of Venice. They are Monet, transformed alchemically by Venice. There's a difference. Seven, the birds of Venice. When Madame Monet awoke one morning near the end of their Venice sojourn, only the sound of pigeon wings filled the air on the balcony where she stood listening. The birds of Venice had gone silent. Venice. Red, blue, and green waters, backgrounds, alleyways were deep water wakens into sleep, shape and form, of, softens it to absorb an eye gaze, moves across, absorbs so many reds, piquant, green, history rides through them within yellow, blue, so many blues, the earth is blue, the water is blue, stone yellow, plaster, dries the experiment, the eye, Names the name of being, color tone, renaissance, pigment, here, water, through color, flows, flowing flow, softens, evenings, rides through, plane of senses, into the courtyard of propro, propro, proprioception, the hand sees, feeling, the car sees. Sound, the curvature of time, spells out the motion of everything as liquid as dawn yields to other light, to follow dusk and explosion, ringing reds to orange sky, absorbs them together through swash of ore breaking, word soften, color, whisper, surface, oh.
So around 1993, I got interested in what the language of a text would tell me that the author hadn't intended to say. And I decided to start using constraints as a way of prospecting for the author's subconscious or barely conscious obsessions. At the same time, I had become very interested in the origins of the Gothic novel. And to make a long story short, I discovered a paradox in the lives of the first Gothic novelists that nobody had seemed to pay very much attention to, even though the facts were not hidden in any way. So just to remind you who those people are, Horace Walpole, who wrote The Castle of Otranto, William Beckford, who wrote Vothek, Matthew Lewis, famous for a book called The Monk, and Anne Radcliffe, who wrote many books, but the one um, that I ended up using was called The Mysteries of Udolpho. So the paradox that I discovered is that all of these writers were involved to a great degree with the slave trade and abolition. Uh, many of them owned slaves, or, and quite a lot of slaves. What, Beckford was the richest man in England on the basis of his uh, plantations in Jamaica. And, um, and the other thing was that the three men were all gay or bisexual at a time when uh, homosexual relations were punishable by death in England. So these writers occupied two poles of the legal system. They owned people and had the power of life and death over those people. But at the same time, they were potential victims of capital punishment for pursuing their own natural inclinations. And my understanding is that that created a psychological um, sort of impossibility for them, the kind of uh, state of mind that drives you to create a new mode of expression because there's no available mode for saying the things you have to say. <clears throat> so the procedure that I developed, I picked Anne Radcliffe's novel because I kept coming across the word plantation in that book and it seemed very odd for a book set in Europe. And um, I developed a, a kind of procedure which is a more disciplined form of the procedure called erasure. So I kind of selected one word from each line and never repeating any two lines. And I extracted this hidden text, um, kind of listening for it and uh, eliciting it from her novel. So I'm going to read from that book. And I'm going to start in the middle. So I extracted this hidden text, and then I contextualized it with quotations from contemporary letters, journals, works of fiction, various, and also images, contemporary images. So this book has a different look from my other books, but um, there it is. Okay, so. 16, the planter's favorite slave has had enough. Hear further, dared ink. The slave, faithful of fade, cheerless, pale, him assured smile, 
My, 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 Smile said. From Matthew Lewis's The Monk, 1796. He doubted not that being beyond the reach of help, cut off from all the world and totally in his power, Antonia would comply with his desires. Secure from a discovery, he shuddered not at the idea of employing force. Or, if he felt any repug repugnance, it arose not from a principle of shame or compassion. Morning seemed disorder, faint slowly with waiting breakfast. Little breakfast waited, envy neat health and sir presence, cream with anxiety. Length of hope to depart silently, going over long trembling luster, current of regret, O oh, tenderness, safety, childhood, place, long regret, imposed home. State not years, person days sunk road, she road, thought world, closing. Her will of interruption began with botany. There are certainly many excellent qualities in the Negro character. Their worst faults appear to be this prejudice respecting obeya and the facility with which they are frequently induced to poison to the right hand and to the left. A neighboring gentleman, as I hear, has now three Negroes in prison, all domestics, and one of them grown gray in his service, for poisoning him with corrosive sublimate. His brother was actually killed by similar means, yet I am assured that both of them were reckoned men of great humanity. Matthew Lewis, Journal of a West India Proprietor, January 18, 1816. 17. His widow finds contentment. Madame alone, conversing impatiently, bloom now beneficent pleasure, bloom enthusiasm for mourning manner, and voluntarily expressed countenance art. From the interrogation of the Negress Assam, extract of the minutes from the registry of the Tribunal of Le Cap, 27th September, 1757. The slave Jean, at whose quarters she arrived on Friday, went to find some herbs. They were blue verbena, wild raspberry, and pois puant with their roots, which he piled into a wooden container in front of Assam, the interrogated. That he mixed an egg yolk into them along with boiler scrapings and made it all into a ball, as fat as his finger was black. More little grief came to this widow estate in magic up balm of consolation in another parting. 18. Plantation Sociality. Distress perfections, hint, enough distressing. Opposite porticos, subsided with season into continually surrounding agreeable light, leaving bustle adjoining self-importance, once contemptuous they attended to pleasure of disappointments on topics paint drawn, beyond family, friends, enjoying bank living and portico sal salutations. The plain plantations with descent to some chain hid with branching of pride, commonly convulsed, observed sullenness lurking.
19. The sound of drumming. The habitation listened. Remote something was ill, feared, distance necessary, had fainted in if friends to gold, pause, few spies behind dance, swelling the shadows, mountain to must, can, shall, light, lead, watch, your now once happy laugh with your wealth. Observe countenance towards dancing, fear dancing, very life. Dance perceiving, dance but accomplish, dancing now inquiring, rose in not bowed look, known for will dancing. The deep eye of grow within roar, inmost guide, bid for wide, wild fall. Dance, name the lie, hear through clouds our vessel, all cry that wave. Midnight became manner of working, agitation, and charging the circumstances already hatred, present vigilance, strain, uninterrupted. Roused voices in moonlight, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, 20, the slaves dance. Heightened dance round curiosity and contention. Conductor assisted moonbeams, all with unfeigned fever, found communicated family. Sweet old sympathy of possessed strain. Only family lost, family dancing, may live by hope. Live not scarcely where moonlight permitted, body no effort. Hope guides, spirits meet, meet. Moonlight stealing. Roused voices in moonlight made waves ever return. Forms unfolded. Air mansion beyond secluded landscapes. Move picture. That world, thought world, seldom lost dignity the selfishness of truth. Fearing dying, part hesitated upon riot, doubting that purpose of dance before terror. Hastily elder entreated animation, heard himself, honor cannot be Frenchman, following streaming of dance, regret subsided. Kanga bafiote, Kanga Musa Dele, Kanga Doli Ka, Kanga Li. Eh, eh, Mabumba, tie up the Bafioti, tie up the whites, tie up the white, tie up the witches, tie them. Only one. Becoming a maroon. Own you. Impending whip, which, which, terrified quietly. How tired I am of keeping a mask on my countenance. How tight it sticks. It makes me sore. William Beckford, Journal, May 27th, 1787. Imposture, constant overacting, that immoderate animation which sufferings command, prudence designed, silence of policy, a torturing stupor, also last hope, with consider future, 
must be existence. Will, lately grief, silence every consolation that persecution permitted. Object with eyes perceived road into smile, adjoining conviction or might just open window, immediately avenue. Some route to that distance, me would take offer, take little road, bright branches, steeps, half waving mountain tops, melting horizon, cliff often curious, banks listening, silent scene, perched. Appeared again, the overhanging plants of eye fringed the bluish air of instant higher forests sloping from full thoughts along that brow bounded to objects of never sorry. People per precipice perceived, bounded turf equally perceived. Long ascent, meanwhile, fastened steps far to further would whip stop. Question some difficulty, which woods mean yonder window. For he woulds. Only the people among foliage and bright sail, a horror between proposed accommodation and separation, morrow. I have been hunted down and persecuted these many years. I have been stung and not allowed opportunities of changing the barking, snarling style you complain of, had I ever so great an inclination. No truce, no respite have I experienced since the first licenses were taken out for shooting at me. If I am shy or savage, you must consider the baitings and worryings to which I allude, how I was treated in Portugal, in Spain, in France, in Switzerland, at home, abroad, in every region. William Beckford Letter to Lady Craven, circa 1790. 24. Planter Rationalizations. The planters of this island have been very unjustly stigmatized with the accusation of treating their Negroes with barbarity. Some allege that these slaveholders, as they are pleased to call them in contempt, are lawless bashaws, West Indian tyrants, inhuman oppressors, bloody inquisitors, and a long etc. of such pretty names. The planter, in reply to these bitter invectives, will think it sufficient to urge, in the first place, that he did not make them slaves but succeeded to the inheritance of their services in the same manner as an English squire succeeds to the estate of his ancestors, and that, as to his Africans, he buys their services from those who have all along pretended a very good right to sell, that it cannot be for his interest to treat his Negroes in the manner represented, but it, that it is to use them well and preserve their vigor and existence as long as he is able. Edward Long, The History of Jamaica, 1774. Why believe assurance of tell, sliding knot of suppress eloquently, when the groan pronouncing doubt alighted, the bank trembled in disengaged answer, in assurances leaving subject to that indisposition of bleeding with afterwards, sometimes, instruments, falls. An exemplary betrayal. 
from Governor Balcaris, letter to the Duke of Portland, undated January 1796. I hold the treaty signed by Major General Walpole on the one part, Colonel Montague James, the chief of the Maroons, on the other part, and ratified by me as absolutely nothing. Thomas considered respect insignificant, obstacle since evident to uneasiness, dismission, wrong, inclinations trusted to unattended gardens. Conscious stealing was triumph and indignation gratification. Insolence by words, sir, will revenge the misled. Endeavoring in language, such contempt, some return, not terrified of declaring right. Take the side that neglect never discernment, but choice, contempt, seeming comparative to deceiver whose pride and fortunes were occasion to bear exasperated mind, that education by despise, but own every sorrow forced. Thank you. Hi, it's so nice to be here with my friends. Uh, Honor to re read with Rebecca, Marty, and Wendy. I'm reading fiction, um, delving into a little known text, Little Puppy. <clears throat> um, by what the author's name. Um, Mary Bell Sunter, copyright 2004, translated from the Dutch. This story tries refusing the tedious curve of rising action, spasm, falling action, for a few reasons, not least because it's about an earnest dog. This happens near the late, uh, near the end of the late Anthropocene, so much death all around. The dog loathed moving. All the neighbors called him Dogalog. For, still as a log, he lay in a trench almost all the time because he'd always been there. Dogalog's face seemed eager, the apparent sweetness of passivity. Neighbors sometimes called him Rufus, pity, because all names mask, box, or smash life a little. He lay in this ever-present rut in the earth, somewhere beyond the home of his owner, master, who was originally named Carl Driggs, in later years becoming Carl Diggs, for with age as with teeth, men lose letters from their names. Carl Diggs mentioned to the dog, mentioned the dog to all the neighbors leaning from their windows, and he let them know. That hound obeys me. One neighbor called out and waved kindly to Dogalog as if any creature can exist without a tissue of absurdity. Then Dogalog licked himself where most do, tenderly. Carl Diggs checked his watch. Diggs's body and eyes and the earth impelled him to believe that time flows forward as a river, though time does not, in Carl Diggs' view, the story lagged. It had no beats. A powerful injunction bore down that action and conflict, male gender style, must play through its pages, moving the story forward. So Diggs called to the dog, get out of here. Doglog ran to a tree. A story can crawl. When can it breathe alone? He put his hands on a tree's skin. Another neighbor hollered from the sidewalk, but a tree is like a story. It springs up with fruits and funguses too, which are parasites that fashion, fasten to their hosts. 
looking back at Carl Diggs, desiring uh, uh, Carl Diggs, master of the story, desiring another to which to run, Dogalog scrabbled at the tree's skin. He ran to the grasses. Surely Diggs would favor a well-timed denouement, though no story can fully express or contain our living. The parts of life unable to fit into methodologies always spill out from the sides, similar to the aggressive blue mold, which advanced threateningly from the seams of the story's structure, moving toward hapless dogalog, each of them born innocent. Sometime later, the dog traveled to Pasadena. He found a house. He said, well, I'm not really doing anything else. I might as well get married. So Dogalog met Debbie Hansen, a quality individual. He married himself out of the story and away from Carl Diggs. Could it be real? Certain people in history simply stand out such that others are better from no for knowing them. Debbie Hansen was one of those. Prepossessing, smart, disarming, she elevated everyone around her. She girded the story and evoked wishes and pathos, even without meaning to. So it became hers, and the story went on to succeed. Um, this is from uh, my novel called Mice 1961, which is supposed to be published next year. And um, I've had um, to keep up with all these characters in it. It takes place one night at a party, and there's a lot of characters. You don't need to know who they are. Um, they just drift in and out. There's a few main characters. Um, it takes place at a party. I just said that. Neighbors flowed in and out, swapped in and out on the patio. Night surround us, surrounded us then. The lamplight grew golden. Now Sissy, from her place in the pink room's easy chair, rallied the party goers, calling out, how's about Trudy Gagel's fame? Sherry, on the couch, looked startled. My sister has fame? What do you mean? Didn't you know that Trudy's writing was published in a magazine? Asked the older woman, slowly lifting a hand to her mouth, flashing her tongue to the knuckle to swipe away drops of yellow juice. Goodness, is it true? Asked Harriet, overhearing coming closer. That's wonderful news, came the astonished voice of the dentist. Under the far wall's high window, Sheila, Harriet, Marge, Florence, Minnie, Millie, and others exchanged glances, then headed to the sofa as well, the closer to listen. It's a fact. Trudy is a published writer, Sissy told them. I think I heard the same from somebody's mother, peeped Joyce. Marge asked Sherry, your family always preserves fruit in the summer, right? Yes, but what has that to do with writing in magazines? Sherry, face blotch, blotchy, cried. Marge, Marge shrugged tiredly. Sugar is famous for memorializing the past, you know, the preserves of the summer yard and that sort of thing. Photographs preserve food too, Motes cried out. My old piano teacher told me that. Marge is right, because Trudy, if she writes expressively, uh, preserves life in a way. So it must be a family trait, Harriet reasoned, ignoring Motes. I wonder if she wrote about you in the magazine, Sherry. Sherry paled. I hope not. Ask her, said the poet Culp, kneeling on a cushion, holding a tinker toy. I never even knew my sister was an author of writing. Sissy gestured with an upturned palm. People change. No, Sissy, insisted Harriet. I believe this firmly. People and things don't change. They really don't. People are as they are. Entering the room, Edelston offered. Potato chips changed the snack world. Are potatoes people? Harriet challenged. Are you sure it was our Trudy that wrote in the magazine? Asked Millie, leaning in. Didn't I say so? Snapped Sissy. A raft of further neighbors, Solly, Honey, Lorette, Helen Dale, Brahms, the dentist, and Cindy, and the woman who didn't speak, 
all pushed through the doorway. What happened, they said, squeezing around the sofa. Old Sissy held the center. Trudy's gotten into some kind of writing career, she reestablished. I even have the proof in my purse. She leaned down from her, for her pocketbook, stretching its leather mouth widely. Here's the magazine, the most recent issue of Teenagers Weekly. Should I read it aloud? Yes, cried neighbors. Why, Sherry, what's wrong? Asked Honey from behind many others. Why are you so red in the face? I know why, Solly said, sidling close, because Yum Yum's on the loose. He's lost. To lose a dog is terrible, said Florence. Sherry, get a horse. Here's the problem, Sissy kept on, relishing it. Sherry just craves attention. I can feel it, don't you, Sherry? Oh, we know that Trudy's won more blue ribbons at school than her sister ever did. Each girl's jealous of the other's accomplishments, and they've squabbled for years about who's best. Hildy, their mother, herself said she can't tell which of her daughters is better. Does your, doesn't your mother have, decided, have trouble deciding about that, dear? Sherry sat tightly to herself on the couch, glaring at the high window. Yes. Sissy upended her purse, and the thick magazine slid out, its bright color cover photo depicting smiling, open-mouthed people. The crowd of partygoers cooed. Marge cried, Trudy's out on the patio. Go bring her in here, the little intellectual. We should congratulate her. So, so Edelston and Marge ran to find her. Sissy flipped through the pages. Here, she pointed, and everyone wedged in to see. Believe me now, Joyce breathed over Sissy's shoulder. There's Trudy's name in print. Yes, indeed, she wrote a letter to the magazine, said Sissy proudly. Let me see, said Motes. Could that be some other Trudy Gaggle, asked Solly. I wonder that too, said Hel Helendale. Of course not, admonished Sissy. It's our Trudy. I always knew she was a good girl. Frankly, Motes opined, Trudy's an attractive enough young lady and with a trim enough waistline that she actually could succeed as a writer in the public eye. Everyone nodded, considering. I'll read it out loud, said Sissy, flattening the page, crackling the binding. Gosh, Mrs. Lax, don't you see? Sherry broke out from the couch. It's nothing. Thousands of people write letters to magazines every day, and yet... Motes faced them, raising a finger. And yet, how many letters are selected to appear in the pages of Teenagers Weekly? So very few. Case closed. Now, Sherry, don't steal Trudy's thunder, warned Sissy. Sherry brought quaky hands to cap her knees. What does it take to be accomplished these days? Idly wondered a gaggle family uncle or cousin who'd wandered in late. Bell. Hurry, let's hear the, the letter, said Minnie. Read it. Oh, look, there she is, the famous author, cried out Sissy. Hooray, cried the group. Edelson and Marge pulled scarlet-faced Trudy into the room while a raft of further curious, smiling neighbors and guests jammed into the doorway behind them. One of the last, Bianchi, bared his rough grin and hollered, I hear you've got a new career as a poet, Trudy. The rest of them cheered as Trudy tripped to the sofa near Sissy, explaining, all I did was write a letter. Millie shrugged loosely. I'm with Larry. Trudy's writing was chosen. Maybe that's nature's way of showing that she should continue to develop her art. Sherry visored her hand to her damp forehead. Go on, read the story, cried Edelston. Sissy reached for her sunglasses, for her eyeglasses. No, I'll read it, jumped Moat, said Moats, jumping forward and grabbing the magazine, and he stood before the group aglow. Goodness, breathed Sissy. Dear editor, Moats read, I don't often write letters, but your magazine is terrific. He glanced up and smiled, drinking in the group's interest. I found your story, Copper Angels, by Mrs. Gretchen Bullis, extremely enjoyable. In fact, it was romantic. Giggles arose from the group. I especially like the part about the hair. This is what I expect from a good romance story, to be entertained and enchanted, he continued. 
Others may have their opinions, but Copper Angels made this girl happy the whole day after I read it. You wrote that? Asked Helen Dale with dull awe. Trudy shrugged. You're modest, called someone. It was just a letter, said Trudy. Wonderful, called out Cindy, her hand in the dentist's hand. While at the rear, Bianchi pounded his fist on the door jam, emphasizing this view. Why'd you write a letter to the magazine, Trudy? asked Marge. I don't know. Girls like reading romances, Edelstem informed them, jiggling his foot. I don't want to read romances, laughed Motes. I want to live them. Trudy always was the go-getter, said Belle, with a defeated air that made him seem more an uncle than a cousin. By then, Trudy's blush was so acute that her thin yellow hair alongside her face appeared near green. And Sherry, who'd slid to the far end of the couch, leaned over its arm as if about to be sick. Heaven's finished reading it, cried Sissy. Okay, Motes agreed. There isn't much left. Please print more stories like that. Yours sincerely, Trudy Gagel, Reef Way, Miami. The group laughed patteringly. Moats turned the magazine out to show the page and print. Yes, smack dab in the magazine, Sissy confirmed. Remarkable, said Honey softly, pouring water. Suddenly, Sherry jumped up from the couch toward the crowd, extending her wrist, on which, hulk, on which hung a slim gold chain. Did everyone see my new bracelet? She cried. Yvonne, I had to step out for just a sec, but thank you all for coming. Feel free to hang out and uh, have some drinks. <laughs>